Good morning, good afternoon, good evening um, from wherever you're calling in from, and welcome to today's panel, Demystifying Big Data, Cloud Computing, and Integration to Generate Tangible Results for Your Business, brought to you by Scribe Software. We've got a great lineup today, and we'll be jumping into the conversation shortly. We've got a couple of quick housekeeping items before we get started. Um, the hashtag for today, if you are following along on Twitter, is pound int web. So if you have any questions or would like to share insights with your audience, uh, please use that hashtag. Once again, pound int web. I'd like to uh, introduce to you our panelists today. We've got a great panel. First is uh, Mike Fawcett, who is the vice president of. Uh, Vice President of Software Business Solutions for IDC. Mike leads IDC Software Business Solutions Group, which includes research and consulting in a broad set of enterprise software applications, software partners and alliances, software vendor business models, and cloud computing. He also provides thought leadership in the area of social applications and the transition to the social business, with extensive executive experience with software vendors ranging from large enterprise companies to small Silicon Valley startups. Mr. Fawcett brings a unique perspective by relating research data and trends to the overall strategic focus and go-to-market strategy. His Twitter handle is mfawcett, that's M-F-A-U-S-C-E-T-T-E. -T -T -E. Mike, uh, please say hello to our audience, and uh, what did we catch you in the middle of today? <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, certainly uh, happy to be here, and uh, I think this will be a, a fun conversation. It's definitely a conversation that I have quite often. In fact, I just got off a call with a with a, a couple of Wall Street firms that were asking some of the same things. So it's definitely on the top of a lot of people's minds. Great, Mike. Welcome. Looking forward to hearing your insights. Um, our next panelist is Thomas Vanderwall. He is currently a senior strategist at Design for Context. He's over 23 years of experience designing, developing, and maintaining data and information systems. He's led projects and programs that brought together large collections of data into one system and interface to, to find relevant data and patterns so organizations can be better informed. His Twitter handle is InfoCloud. He recently co-authored The Connected Company with Dave Gray and he even coined, is credited with coining the term folksonomy. Thomas, please say hello and uh, where are you calling in from today? Hello, I'm in Bethesda, Maryland, and where it's a little bit overcast and finally chilly. <laughs> Very good. Well, we're looking forward to, uh, to hearing your thoughts today. Our last panelist, last but certainly not least, is Betsy Billhorn, who is the Vice President of Product Management for Scratch Software. Um, as Vice President of Product Management, She's responsible for leading Scribe's new product initiatives and guiding the company's corporate and product marketing efforts, including the execution of Scribe's go-to-market strategies. Um, for the audience, you should know that Betsy is feeling a little bit under the weather today, but she has agreed to uh, still join us. So please take it easy on her as her voice sounds a little bit muffled and clouded, but uh, she's still got plenty of good stuff to share. Betsy, please say hello. Hello. <laughs> Very good. Very good. So we've got several topics on the table today, and uh, we could probably start with any one of them and fill up the entire hour. But I think uh, just to sort of set the table a little bit, the larger narrative here is really that one could argue that the role of IT is dramatically changing as, as, as technology changes with it. So as a result, I think CIOs, CTOs, IE man, IT managers and directors, um, and line of business leaders, quite frankly, are being faced with all of these new trends, all of these new technologies, these capabilities. And what we found is a lot of the organizations are just trying to sort this out and figure out what are these things and then how do, how do we take advantage of them. So maybe, um, Mike, if you want to maybe set the table for us, starting with the changing landscape, the changing role of IT, and then specifically how each of these things intersect um, with, with, with the changing role of, of the CIO. 
Okay, sure, Brian. That's a quick answer. Oh no, wait. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting time I think for uh, for, for CIOs and and you know there's a lot of, of opportunity to add a lot of, of value to the business. Um, I think we've seen a lot of shift in you know in in uh, tech savviness out into the line of business quite often now too. And so, you know, the the IT organizations in, ending up in a situation where I think they're more of a a business partner. With um, with those line of business uh, operations, as they really start to to embrace a lot more technology in what they're doing, and I mean, if you think about the the topics that we're talking about, uh, big data or you know smart data, whatever we want to call it, and and integrations in cloud. I mean, cloud, <clears throat> you know, for for a while, cloud really um, co disrupted, I think, because it gave line of business the opportunity to uh, to self provision and per perhaps get um, involved in uh, with some products that you know, may have been at the time a bit of a, a under the radar sort of approach, but that's changed now. And you know, as more IT organizations embrace uh, the idea that their shops are going to be hybrid, they're going to have some cloud, they're going to you know continue with some of their applications for a while. Their on premises are hosted, and and you have to kind of try to to make sense of that environment. Um, the the onus really shifts for them to be more of this you know process analyst and really help the business define. Uh, but places where they can utilize technology to, to deliver value, and you know, I think, like I said, the topics we're talking about today are, are ones that can can really deliver significant value, particularly if you think of them as as complementary and intersecting. So, so staying on the topic of cloud just for a second, Thomas, uh, you know, almost a decade ago, you coined the term info cloud. Maybe you can use that as a lead-in to. To talk about your experience and then where you see cloud technology going in general. Yeah, the the info cloud is essentially where uh, your information as an individual or as a business is stored, um, and had broken it down into a personal info cloud, which is something that the individual, where they store things, they control what it's called, where it's stored, how to query it. Um, and how it follows them, and they they interact with it. The local info cloud is um, more of an organizational. It's a, um, it's not you don't control where it's stored um, in the service. The individual doesn't, but um, and they don't control what it's called, but it's familiar. Um, so it's quite often a workplace. Um, it could be a business partner uh, in a B two B relationship, but you know how to query it. Uh, it's familiar to you over time, uh, and it's something that's um, relatively trusted, and it's uh, quite often a go-to resource. Uh, one of the things that uh, we've seen sort of the shift um, is the external info cloud, which is, are those things outside of the, the local info cloud. So if you don't have the resources internally, being able to turn to something outside, so when you don't know what the answer is, you don't know who to turn to. You turn to uh, Google or Bing, and you start searching externally. Um, but now we have services that are being able to structure those in external resources to find uh, content and data, and being able to bring that into our uh, local info cloud through APIs and and other formats. Um, so that's really shifting quite a bit. Uh, one of the things that's um, has been happening over a good stretch of time is how work is happening and where work is happening. Uh, with a shift to cloud interfaces and tools, uh, the traditional desktop uh, so-called productivity tools have been replaced. Uh, having information in the cloud and, and synced, you no longer are living at the desktop of your laptop. Um, and with the, the move to tablets, um, and being able to work in the field with um, lightweight hardware, uh, that's completely changed things. And being able to uh, work in cloud environments for collective and collaborative uh, teamwork and working with, with others, uh, the document as the central point of where information is created and content is created and where the interactions are happening uh, no longer is the center. Uh, it's now happening in uh, web-based services, it's now happening in small applications that are loosely joined and quite often syncing the data and you can access that data through and that content that you're working around uh, fairly easily through a myriad of different apps all because it uh, has the same underlying structure. 
um, and been talking to companies in the last particularly six months, and um, they've been changing their licensing and moving toward uh, sort of the office uh, online versions, and their field workers, the people who have been out in the field or their sales community, is no longer working in office uh, because office wasn't on Android tablets and it wasn't on uh, the iPad, and they were using those in the field. Uh, they started working in lighter structures, and they don't really want to go back to using Word and other services. Um, really, really and interesting. I'm going to interrupt you there real quick, Thomas. I'm going to come back to you because you brought up so much good stuff that sure. we could hang, hang out for a while. Um, but one of the main things that I just picked up on what you said, is, you know, you started with the, you know, the info cloud, which was a personal info cloud. It was local. It was, you know, either on the firewall or on the network or something. And then you talked about going out to um, external resources, right, which is a, more of a public cloud or an external cloud. And then you sort of transitioned into the topic of integrating the two. And I'm going to use that as a segue to kind of talk to Betsy a little bit. Obviously, she, she sits at the middle of integration, and she's talking with um, you know, both her, her internal customers and external customers about this topic of, of integration. We've got data now in many places. The cloud is obviously growing in many contexts, and we'll dig into that a little bit more. But Betsy, maybe you can give us a clue on what you're seeing on the integration front. What are the biggest challenges? How do I get something that is local and integrate that with something in the cloud, or, or if I'm using multiple cloud providers, how am I integrating between each of those, especially when the technologies might be proprietary and, and not, not as open as, as we'd like them to be? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, we, I think there's a couple of things that we've been seeing, um, especially over the last couple of years, and, and as we touched about with the cloud, um, it, there's just such an explosion of the number of data sources, and I think also the cloud technologies bring the ability to collect more data, right? So if you think about even five or ten years ago, um, the amount and type of data that I'm collecting from these different applications, now we have external data coming, we have data services. Um, so from a customer perspective where we have seen in the past maybe people were integrating one or two or three applications, and it was typically within their business, um, now we're seeing, you know, people going up into, you know, 18, 20, 30 different sources that they're trying to bring together. Um, and, and that definitely becomes much more complex. Um, I think, you know, as far as, as the solutions are out there, you know, they've been trying to keep up. Um, one of the other things that um, that brings is, you know, we talk about silos of data. So where you might have had in the past in your business, again, five or six silos of data. Now we're talking many silos of data, and they're coming not only within IT, but also from what, you know, without, right? So those different lines of businesses, they're going out and getting cloud apps or getting cloud services. They're having silos of data that maybe other lines of business don't even know, but might be important pieces of data that if you put them together um, could bring really, you know, real value. So um, so that that is something that we've, we've definitely seen increase, um, and it's continuing to increase. Um, I think from a technology perspective, the type of protocols and ways that you can knit all that data together, while those are increasing, again, you know, you, you have so much choice, um, what do you choose, right, and, and how do you do that? And some are more complicated than others, others are more mature, and so I, I think a lot of customers in IT are really looking kind of for guidance there um, and an easy way to do that and a more standardized way to do that. So hanging on that thread, I'm going to come back to Mike, um, data, right? And I think there's, we, Susan touched on it, we've seen an explosion of data. Um, we used to have two or three, it used to be demographic data, we might merge that with some, you know, transactional data, and off we were, and we had a standard database. And now we're kind of moving, you know, whether you like the term or not, from, a, from structured data to unstructured data. And not only is it unstructured and doesn't fit quite within the taxonomy of our existing data sets, but there's infinite more data out there. So how do we begin to wrestle with this, and how do we begin to wrestle with big data and actually use it for some sort of tangible benefit for our customers and for our organization? Well, you know, when, when we started using the term big data, I have to admit I, I fought it for, for quite a while because um, when I think about big data, it doesn't mean anything to me. And then, actually, somewhere along the way, I realized it's, it's the perfect term because, in fact, it doesn't mean anything to anybody. 
That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 big and it's data. Cool. Okay. Now what do I do? Um, that, that's that's actually the problem, right? And that's what we're talking about: the fact that we have this explosion of data, multiple data sources, multiple data types, structured, unstructured, that sort of thing. And in the end, if we just step back and we look at kind of what's what's the problem we're trying to solve and what are we really trying to get out of this? The the thing is that over over time we we've moved from uh, you know these systems of transaction that we've had for for years that automate processes but when they automate processes they they naturally create exceptions the exceptions have gotten overwhelming frankly and now we need people to make decisions and to make effective decisions you have to have data so how do you get people with the right data in the right context in a workflow so that you can make a, a decision, and, and in fact, that's a lot of the new business model. I think is this idea of connecting people and data to a problem, to an issue in some context, and then making a decision. Sense and respond, I call it. So you listen, <clears throat> you collect, you parse, you you make some sense. So what we're really talking about is is building some kinds of systems, and we're starting to see the evolution of this, where we take unstructured and you put some structure to that over, you know, in some in some context in the system with structured data, pair those together, but the but that's not the trick. I mean that's hard, but but that's not the trick. The trick is then getting it into a smart decision based system that pulls people, the right people, together around that data in the right context so that they can they can make that decision, whatever that decision might be. And and this could be a short term issue that I, you know, I do a hundred times a day, or it could be a six-month project that takes, you know, 20 people. It, it it varies greatly across businesses and industries and, and activities and role and that sort of thing. But the general concept, I think, is is really good. That's the thing we have to do. We have to take big data, turn it into smart data by building in some key, some way to structure, and then tagging that into some some problem, some issue, some context. In other words. And with the right people in the right hands at the right time, you, you can use that to make a decision. And in an ongoing way, you can make good, you know, fast, effective business decisions. And 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 I think that's really the the key to thinking about this is above the transaction, you've got this system of decision and system of relationship that pull data people together in that work context at the right time. Well, I think I'm going to. I almost wonder if I should ask this question, but I'm going to get out of the way because I think it ties really, really nicely into this change in work. You know, this um, we've we've heard and seen lots of different um, terms for you know Enterprise 2.0, the social enterprise, the connected company. Thomas, I know you have done quite a bit of work and research um, in and around that world, and obviously data, as Mike just perfectly illustrated, is is core and central to enabling new value streams and new flows of information so that we can get the right people and the right information in the right context at the right time so that business can be done more effectively or or so that you know change in the world can be done more effectively if you're working for a nonprofit or or in the, in the sense of government. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna be quiet and Thomas I know you probably have plenty of things to say here. You've talked about the topic of lenses and done a lot of work there. I'm going to step back and maybe you can talk about the intersection of this change in how work is done and how that intersects with these technologies that we're talking about, big data, cloud, and then the integration of all of them together. Sure. Um, yeah, the, this change in, in work, um, you know, it's, we've seen it in our personal lives and um, Mobile devices getting just insanely powerful, um, and having incredible capabilities. And you know, one of the the intersection points is around calendaring, um, and watching services like Tempo, where you're aggregating, you put in a, a business meeting, and it comes in through email, and it looks in your email and is pulling who is going to be in that meeting and bringing the contact the contact information for them, bringing in the documents that are related that have been mentioned in emails leading up to the meeting, um, and bringing it all within a single touch point on your mobile device. Um, so when you're out, you have access to everything. Um, you can let people know that you're running running late, and it's that's sort of a, a good pinpoint to start backing out and looking at 
just enterprise in, in general, and being able to bring bring that data, that intersection of data, uh, documents, content, the the who, uh, the when and the where, um, all together. In mid two thousands, was working uh, with a few organizations and pointing out that the intersection of almost all the work that we do is related around calendar, address book, and uh, information, documents, and data. Uh, figuring out the calendar is a large pain, but it is easily to, you know, relatively easy to, to understand. The address book is much easier uh, in sorting out the who, but being able, the data has now just sort of exploded, and being able to have it at your fingertips, um, you know, market analysis, being able to look across, you know, what's being said around the web, being able to, you know, Use your inbound traffic to your website, looking at product from links backing out to uh, blogs, articles, journals, online forums that are open. Um, taking that pure content, doing entity extraction to take this unstructured data to be able to uh, pull it in and parse it to pull out who's talking about things, what other products and companies are being talked about, um, are there insights? And one of the things that we're continually dealing with is our taxonomies internally for how we structure information internally. Um, we need to be better able to embrace uh, what our customers are talking about and our business partners and being able to build synonym repositories for those. And so if you're taking that data that's in content that is outside and being able to, to parse it in some way to identify gaps in your taxonomy, um, that's going to greatly help, help you connect to uh, your customers and business partners, um, and then figuring out how to store that, how to um, you know be able to parse it when you're dealing with big data um, and large data sets. They don't being able to parse it doesn't happen quickly. Um, if you're working with a, a few terabytes and being able to churn through it to be able to have the you know, those nuggets in your hand, you need to start a few hours ahead of time, and being able to essentially reduce the data set to get trends, understanding, and being able to understand you know, when in the, the business day or, or the work cycle are you going to be needing that information. Uh, you don't want to start triggering a, a three-hour query um, you know, five minutes before you need that information as you're walking into a meeting. So having an understanding of you know, what are the types of queries that are being asked, what sort of information is needed, being able to digest it and get business intelligence um, you know, at the at the fingertips and digest it down to a, a one pager or two pager um, that's ready 15 minutes before your meeting or a known cycle. Um, how, did, that's uh, how, when, how do you feel like in memory computing and um, you know things like SAP HANA will af will affect or change that lead time that you need? And you know, because we've heard stories, you know. Things that used to take three weeks, um, you know, being cut down to just a few hours, and things that used to be run overnight now are available within yep. just a few minutes. Um, how do you guys? I'm gonna I'm gonna switch back over to Mike real quick because I know you've got a, a, a kind of a broad section of, of conversations around this stuff, and like you said, you, you you have that. How does that impact the conversation that we're having today? The and I'll just frame it as the increase in processing power and the ability of what we can do with large amounts of data? Well, you know, I think it ties in really well with, uh, with this, this concept of decision systems or systems of decision systems that can um, help you in real time do things more effectively. Because if you think about it, you're right, that's one of the big issues. And, and you know, as Thomas said, backing up from that and going, oh, okay, I'm going to, I think I'm going to need this at X. And that's, I need three hours back from that to be able to get it. That's a significant problem in a business model that's based on the idea of, of taking some action based on data in you know in a real time environment. So, you know, if the if this in in, in memory technology for, for example gives you the capability to compress that to you know to, to near real time, then you can you could you really could build a system of decision that is flexible and responsive enough to the context of the problem versus uh, I have to know what the problem is going to be 
uh, three hours before I need the data because I can't get it until then. I mean, you see that. That sounds ridiculous when I say it that way because <laughs> it, it, it actually is, right? It, it's a problem um, <clears throat> because if you're talking about a business model based on a, a network business, this you know, connected ecosystem where customers and partners and employees and you know, the, the, everything is, is much more interconnected and, and is, frankly, more real time than it's ever been, your ability to make um, decisions on the fly actually is a huge competitive advantage. And so if the underlying technology can enable that, if, you know, if, if in memory technology from whatever vendor you choose, and it's, you know, it's, it's growing in, in numbers of, of, of capabilities and availability from, you know, from the large vendors, Oracle and, and, and um, you know, SAP, and, and I'm sure, uh, I'm sure IBM will have an answer soon. And, you know, it, all these, all these companies are, are getting this out, but why? Because, in the end, I'm an end user. I need to be able to get to what I need very quickly. And and actually, the other half of that is I, I still think is is just as important. And maybe that's because I spend a whole lot of time, you know, working around some social kind of topics. So the idea of a, a network is really important. If you think about the idea of a social network inside your business, that's <clears throat> you know that sounds cool, but th there's really a business function to that, and that is. How do I get the right people, the right person, the expert, the person that is truly the expert, not reported the, that, that they're an expert, but how can I establish that? And, and so that's the other side of it. That's the enterprise social network or the system relationship that ties with the system of decision, getting fast data and fast access to the right people in that context is absolutely critical to, to be competitive in a, a global connected, you know, hyper connected kind of environment. Once again, for the audience, this title of this session is Demystifying Big Data, Cloud Computing and Integration to Generate Tangible Results for Your Business. This session will be recorded, so if uh, you're missing all this good stuff that these guys are sharing along the way, you will have access to this after the session. Um, once again, I'd like to invite you to ask questions in the GoToWebinar panel, or go ahead and ask questions on Twitter with pound, I-N-T, web. Um, going back to um, sort of what you said, Mike, and, and what I really enjoy about your perspective is that you're always bringing that back to the business. Um, line of business leaders are saying, yes, I want to move quicker. I want to enable my sales reps to have the right information at the right time. Um, and I want to, you know, do this stuff across systems. I don't really care where the data is. The user doesn't really care where the data is or how it's getting or any of the stuff that's happening on the back end. And so we've seen a line of business leaders actually take the bull by the horns and begin to experiment with some of these apps that are increasingly available. Um, but soon, you know, I've seen many times where these line of business users run into a problem and they say, oh, oh well, I don't really know how to do this. And, and going back to your initial point, Mike, now they need a partner. Now they need to go back to a CIO or, or a senior IT leader and say, listen, here's the problem I'm trying to solve. Here's what I'm trying to enable for my team, whether that be an external facing team or an internal facing team, and how do I enable them with all these things? And, and that's creating a lot of challenges very practically for IT leaders. So I'm going to come back to, to Betsy. Um, what are some specific challenges that you're seeing being brought, being brought to you? And it'd be interesting to hear um, who's bringing them to you. Is it the line of business folks or is it their IT partner? that's most interested in tying these apps or tying data together um, in order to enable these, these more rapid insights to be available to their teams? Well, you know, I, I think it's, it, it, we were seeing a, um, an interesting dynamic because I, what I would say is what's happening more and more is that the line of business um, leader is engaging um, and saying, hey, I need integration. Um, and they're they're going out and they're doing research and they're going to IT and so what is happening is we're seeing them come in in partnership or the line of business leader will initially bring in um, an integration project and initiate that and kick that off with IT. Um, ultimately, you know, as, as you said, you know, it is it's the nuts and the bolts and the plumbing and the tactical issues behind. Um, we we end up engaging with the technical folks and in in that decision making process, but um, that definitely has been a big shift. So for us, when we're we're talking, we both have to be able to talk to the business issues and how we can solve that for you, but then also from a technical aspect and how we can appeal and make that simple and easy for the IT department um, to work in partnership with the line of business. 
Um, I think the other thing that we're seeing quite a bit is that where it used to be a static thing, I just want to put my stuff together. Um, the line of business is, is very dynamic about the kind of data they want, that they want to bring in data from more sources, they want to do it very quickly, um, and they want to be able to shift and change. And, um, you know, that's, that's been a pretty new requirement where we're not really seeing that as much when, when the technical folks come and speak to us about that. So I think that's a new requirement as well when we're talking about um, putting in integration or putting in other integration technologies. <coughs> Can you give me an example of, uh, of what you're talking about? Yeah, so, um, so we had a, a, a client um, who uh, was working on, they needed a BI reporting on their uh, 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 very brand name uh, bicycle manufacturer. And they needed a BI and analytics um, reporting, um, and this was being generated from the sales team and the marketing team. Um, this person worked in the marketing team. Um, he engaged with us initially and ran a proof of concept, and we were able to uh, generate those reports and show the value of what we were doing. Um, and then the second phase of that was actually bringing in the IT organization, so the folks who were doing the data warehousing and running the analytic tools um, and bringing them in, and we then worked with them to kind of expand that project into a full initiative. And that, you know, went live and in production. And we're and, and so that's an example of how we're we're being brought into these conversations. Yeah, really, really interesting. Yeah. So, you know, part of I think most people on the call have probably heard a lot of the benefits of cloud computing. Um, you know, as we enter into this realm, though, you know, we we begin to get into data ownership issues. Um, are we licensing? Because as soon as something becomes digital, it can go anywhere and it can go anywhere at, at warp speed, and we're seeing this, you know, affect our world at the, at the highest level, right, with the, the whole NSA thing and, and the questions that that opens up. Um, at a smaller level, but equally as important to the, to the people who are responsible for managing this stuff is the ownership of the data, um, the privacy of the data, what can we put in the cloud and what can't we put in the cloud. Thomas, can you speak to some of the issues around ownership of the data and then privacy and security around that data and, and kind of what you see, um, both from a journey of where we've come, but also how you believe this, this will evolve and, and what will be, you know, the ideal structure from a platform perspective, a data management perspective over the next couple of years? Yeah, the, the privacy and security question is one within the last two or three months, uh, a lot of it triggered by NSA and just sort of the, the revelations as to what they have access to. Um, and an, auto, an awful lot of organizations, um, their data is essentially, you know, keeping, keeping their data and their data partners um, essentially proprietary is essential for them to be a step ahead of their competitors. Um, and sort of keeping their competitors at, at, at bay a little bit. Um, and so being able to own, uh, own the data, but then when you're uh, partnering and in, in bringing in external uh, data resources, if you're looking at transactional data from uh, various stores and being able to analyze uh, what's being bought along with your, your product, uh, to be able to figure out if you want to set up a partnership with somebody or it starts triggering M&A um, issues and being able to understand customer interest, being able to keep, keep that um, out of your competitor's eyes is, a, is incredibly important. Um, the discussion around where the data is stored um, as, as to what country and what laws apply um, is becoming that's a big hot question. And then the, the questions of, you know, have the data and then also the transmission of it. Um, and being able to ensure that you have a secure transmission, which sometimes uh, the encryption and transmitting very large data sets um, and being able to use the cloud to uh, store the data, process the data, analyze it in, in large amounts and then pushing things back and forth, ensuring that that's encrypted along the way um, sometimes can slow things down a little bit. So it's, um, you know, being able to understand who your providers are, um, 
you know, who the vendors are, what security measures have they taken, how open is it, uh, do they have a back door to things, um, what do you really know about it? That's, I think that examination uh, is becoming quite essential and it's one that uh, the CIO's office is, you know, that's one of their key tasks is security um, and privacy of that data. And so it's, it's an essential question and the questions that we've somewhat taken for granted um, that, yeah, we own this along the way and, you know, everything's fine and nobody's going to see it. Um, you know, that's a huge question. And then sort of the external, you know, when all that data has been churned and analyzed and brought down to a smaller digestible set of information, you know, it's, you know, is that secure? Um, quite often that's ready a few days before, you know, a quarterly announcement for finances. Um, if it's a public company, that is huge. Um, and just being able to keep that information until it's, it's ready to, to go out there. Um, so just, you know, all the things that um, really haven't been considered and um, particularly looking at organizations that everybody considered to be, you know, fortresses when they have security lapses, um, that becomes a large question for every organization. And it's, um, I think that next step is, that we're going to see in the next six months to a year is going to be quite different than what we've seen. Um, mm -hmm. And then you're still trying to be quick and nimble um, and efficient, which sort of runs counter to uh, an awful lot of the measures that we've taken so far. We've had uh, a great, great, great insight and, and feedback, Thomas. We've got a couple of questions that have come in um, that, that dovetail on this. I'm going to ask the first one. I'm going to throw it out to the panel. I'm not sure that anybody has an answer, but I think it's totally applicable to the kind of stuff that you're talking about, Thomas. And the, and the question is, what impact will the Patriot Act have on big data and cloud computing for companies? Um, and this, this, this person actually asked specifically, would it be more sensible to move my cloud and its data to Europe in, in light of increasing legislation and increasing, you know, what some would argue is a police state or getting closer to a police state. Mike or Thomas or Betsy, anybody have an opinion on that? I, I don't know if you saw this, uh, Brian, but just uh, yesterday I think the, it, the news came out of the EU that they're taking a, a deep look at this and see if they want to build some regulations around this that might actually not give you a choice if you're in, in Europe. You may They may legislate where, where you can keep the data, which frankly will have a a huge impact on um, on a lot of cloud computing vendors because you know right now we we, we have this whole kind of string of data centers and and who's got the data is not really an easy question to to an mm -hmm. answer all the time because mm -hmm. it's it's replicated between and it's backed up and it's secure it's here it's there um, so yeah I think it's a really timely discussion but I'll be be completely honest from from our perspective at least and it's not like we haven't had the conversation around this in, at, at IDC but um, but the, the, the problem is you can't answer that question yet because um, there's backlash around what happened with the NSA and um, the revelation, which, you know, is, um, is, is you know, causing a lot of, of uh, people to, to really step back and go, hmm, uh, you know, the fact that uh, we, we've pushed back on China for years and yet we may very well have been more aggressive at this than, than they were at times. Um, and so I think we just don't really know what's going to happen and change. And, you know, the, the idea that, uh, that there's back doors that have been placed in at uh, government request and there's, I mean, it's just, it is all, it's really scary. And, then, you know, it goes, it kind of unfortunately undoes some of the confidence that I think we built in cloud over time by being successful at protecting things. And, and you know, that was one of the initial pushbacks on cloud was data and security and how do we you know, how do we deal with this but now you know I think we were in a place where m most people have gotten pretty comfortable with the idea that the vendors were really doing a great job of security in general I mean anything connected to the internet is at risk we know that but um, but at least they were doing the best that could be done to protect that um, but unfortunately now the, that confidence is maybe a little shaken and so I think you know there's going to be some repercussions from this in this in the cloud end of it uh, our business is going to continue to move. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that. I think, I think, technology-wise, we're going to have to figure out ways to do this, but it could very well cause some some changes. But I just don't know the answer yet. So it's it seems like we're sitting at this tension um, 
between this opportunity to move, to gather data, to move at um, rapid speed, you know, but then that's sort of constrained by today. Privacy is, is the, the topic of the issue and who has access to this data and is not only my data secure, but is my customer's data secure. Um, you know, there's obviously cost savings and business benefit from a strategic perspective from moving to the cloud in many situations. Um, but then it can not only impact you from a privacy and security standpoint and, and rattle the, um, I guess, the confidence of, of your customers, whatever you do, but also there there can be, you know, negative implications. I was recently um, in Atlanta and was, you know, there at the airport for my flight, hour and a half before flight time, and I couldn't get through. I waited for six hours simply because I couldn't print out a boarding pass, and so there I, could, I couldn't get through. Um, security, and that was all due to a to a data center failure in Minneapolis that was housing, um, you know, many airlines uh, applications and data sets. And so I sat there and it failed, and it didn't reflect poorly on, um, you know, the data center as much as it did from for me in my perspective. I had a horrible customer experience with that particular airline, and so the decision of whether to go cloud and where to put your data, obviously, is really really important from very from big perspectives. Um, I've got a couple of questions that sort of um, come from a similar thread. The, the first one is um, from a from a uh, a partner and a VAR of a of a IT vendor, an application vendor that's been around for quite a while. They've traditionally been on premise. Um, more and more, they're moving to the cloud, and and their question really says, you know, we haven't seen a whole lot of customer demand for the cloud, and um, you know, the, the ones that we've seen move to the cloud have haven't been all that successful. So I believe that there's a, a large contingent out there of both bars and resellers and also companies that hear and see all this buzz and these terms about, you know, moving to the cloud and all the benefits and that's where the world is going, but yet tangibly and very, very practically and pragmatically, they're not necessarily seeing a clear benefit. Um, Betsy or, or Thomas, do you want to articulate the benefit? And maybe along with that, um, maybe some of the downsides of moving to the cloud when you're making that sort of consideration. This is Thomas. Um, it's it's one of the things um, you know over the last four or five years when you know, cloud computing and cloud services started uh, bubbling up and watching. There's some organizations that moved out to the cloud early and then have moved things back in. Uh, some have a, a mixed environment. Um, and if you think about you know, three different core pieces of of the cloud is uh, the cloud for data store, uh, cloud for collaboration, collective activities, and cloud for computation. Probably the strongest one is the computation piece and being able to have on on demand uh, just pure churning power uh, to be able to deal with things. Um, and if you're working with a, a mixed model, just being able to have, um, you know, you may only be using um, sort of that burstable computation two or three times a month. Um, but being able to have that, it could be a huge savings. Um, and so it's just you know, organizations of various sizes just being able to have those capabilities just to, to integrate uh, data from partners, other things that you get access to, um, you know, you may not being able to to buy servers, being able to get all the data store, um, you know, being able to have that on demand and being able to, you know, one of the toughest things is the integration piece, um, and being able to have the pipes between the different services, and that's where it gets um, really tricky. Um, so quite often the the cloud services make that integration uh, piece of it much easier than being able to do it in-house. So it sounds like it's more of a case-by-case -case scenario where obviously you've got several different le levels. And, you know, I think it brings up another point is that there's, you know, everybody's relatively familiar with um, software as a service, you know, being hosted in the cloud, but there's actually different levels of IT architecture and infrastructure that can be outsourced and can be placed in the cloud while retaining, you know, either the data or the application or the processing power or, the, or, or what have you um, in-house. And so we're getting a more, I guess, robust cloud um, with more configurations possible 
Um, Mike, do you want to speak to that a little bit, maybe just for some of our listeners that aren't familiar with, you know, the different layers of infrastructure that are available, kind of what the benefits are, and, and it, if, if you can, maybe talk about emerging models about, you know, I guess many, many people are probably asking the question, do, if I make a commitment to the cloud, do I have to move everything there, or are there bits and pieces I can, I can use and come up with these hybrid environments? Okay. Yeah. No. And and actually, just one quick um, kind of aside to the to the uh, Microsoft Dynamics bar that asked the question because I think um, th this actually played well into my answer to what you're you're saying. But but I, I think for, for for you know for for VARs that are thinking about this, and we frankly we've done a lot of work with with the Microsoft um, channel ecosystem uh, around this because it's a hard transition. Um, my, my answer is that you know th things are. Um, in fact, uh, shifting. They're not moving tomorrow. I mean, not 100% of everything is going to move quickly. Uh, it's, you, we're going to be in this hybrid environment for a really long time. But I think that uh, the business uh, in technology, if you're, you know, if you sell software, you've got to start to prepare for this and, and pave the way for a shift. It may be a long-term shift, and in some areas of the country, maybe it's faster than others. But uh, but but it, you're going to get caught flat-footed if you if you don't actually make some preparation around this. And realize that you know it, it is a it's this slow transition. So so that comes into to your question, Brian. Is what are the options? And you know obviously we have plenty of uh, of companies that are are operating on premises software and have been doing that for for a really long time. Um, and and that's not going to change immediately. Um, that's gonna you know that's gonna take a while to to for uh, for businesses to to move everything. But it doesn't mean that we're not seeing a shift, and um, and I think you have to look at it, um, you know, business model wise in, in two different areas. So if you look at the enterprise, what's the enterprise doing? Uh, the enterprise is making shift uh, module by module, function by function, and it's a really slow change. And the change is in some businesses on premises, then sometimes they use a hosted facility to take that same on-premises solution and not manage the infrastructure themselves, so they pay for the, the, the service. Uh, and then you could go one step further. You can do what's called a, a private cloud, which is you know, not on, you're not on infrastructure owned by a, a public cloud vendor. You're on, by, you're on infrastructure that you own. Do you manage it or not is the question. You can outsource that or you can do it yourself, but it still makes the changes the scalability of the of the uh, application and it changes the availability of the application so that it's you know available on the internet uh, and then the last one is uh, is some kind of a public cloud and there's a bunch of different ways that that's done too I mean I don't want to spend much time talking about multi-tenant and virtual tenants and all these other kind of things but the idea really is we've got you know shared resources that give you a great deal of flexibility and scalability that's in, in a subscription based model and lets you you know just consume the service. Uh, so, in other words, use the application without uh, having to manage any of the of the infrastructure, the database, the middleware, any of those things. And and so, I think you see companies move into some mixture of that. A lot of companies are already in hybrid. Uh, I think the difference, though, is that in the mid market, you're seeing companies make really fast changes into a complete cloud, public cloud system because. Uh, in a, and if you're, if you're more, the more resource constrained you are, the more benefit you get from moving to a place where you don't have to invest your resources in managing the infrastructure and the architecture. So, um, so I'd say there's a little bit of difference there. It's not necessarily module by module, but in the in the enterprise, it definitely is. Uh, and it started in CRM and HCM, and now we're seeing you know some financials move and some and some large companies uh, because they you know they've come to the point where they want to modernize. They get advantage out of having some of these new systems and new UIs and new collaborative capabilities and that sort of thing. I want to pick up on that theme from a second, from um, what you just mentioned, and it ties to a, another question that we had come in um, not too long ago. But you started to talk about differences in, in organization size, you know, with the enterprise, you know, having, you know, probably millions, um, if not hundreds of millions invested in the current infrastructure. So they're kind of moving step by step, whereas you get smaller, mid-size, or even into SMB, they're much more agile and they're able to, to shift more quickly into a, into a cloud environment. We had one question that came in related to leveraging big data for SMBs or for these smaller companies. You know, for, for a lot of people, this perception around big data and all this stuff, it, it, it some would argue, and I think this, uh, this person's question kind of infers this, is that is big data within reach? Is it something that SMB should be paying attention to? Or is it just sort of beyond the grasp of the capabilities of the typical SMB? Someone want to take a stab at that one? 
And this is Thomas. The one of the nice things about how things have changed along the uh, in the arena of big data is that it's now more addressable by smaller uh, environments being able to have uh, have cloud resources that allow you to to hold large data sets whether you're uh, buying transactional data uh, from partners being able to understand what's going on in a space and being able to query it um, and to be able to draw your own understanding from it uh, that becomes really powerful um, so you're able to compete at a, a much larger level and be still remain a smaller organization um, the, the difficult side of it is just being able to find the people who have uh, the skill sets to be able to do it um, and things have been changing a fair amount and being able to understand sort of what the different uh, models and analytical tools are and as data sizes start uh, growing um, you know that starts triggering you know what's what's available to you and what sort of skill sets that you need uh, ran across a nice piece in the last week or two and just um, it was someone who's been learning data analytics and just looking at you know what sort of is the cutoff for big data and big data in their uh, framing of it was any time that you had run out of options um, because of data size and the data size was roughly uh, five terabytes and therefore left with um, the only real solution was Hadoop which allows you to use clusters and spread the uh, computation across different servers um, but things below that five terabyte limit just being able to add uh, data being able to add RAM being able to have people who uh, can use scripting languages to uh, do the analytics whether it's Python uh, being able to use uh, things like MathLab or um, uh, uh, things like R and uh, the Wolfram analytics uh, being able to use those on some of the large data sets and large data um, and the computation that you can have inside a box in your own environment is uh, you know almost exponential growth over what was there three to five years ago um, and then being able to do that up in a cloud and uh, and being able to have that on demand uh, is huge and so part of it is just being able to understand your own data what you're capturing what you're holding on to uh, whether it's uh, structured data or unstructured and being able to what access you have to other resources that are out there and uh, whether it's sales whether it's transactions from where things are being sold um, you know being able to look at um, you know, just logistics of, of where things are moving to. There's an awful lot of data um, that can be accessed and the shift to big data and just being able to have it stored. Um, there's markets that have been popping up around just buying the data. Um, we used to only be able to buy small subsets. Now we can buy it in much larger chunks and figure out how relevant that larger chunk is beta, um, on our own rather than having to rely on somebody else to make the decisions on how to uh, provide a subset of that. Yeah, great. So, I, I mean, to, to kind of summarize, I think what I think I heard in your answer is, um, you know, really we've got an evolving landscape where more processing power um, is becoming available to everybody in a, in a cloud environment, more data storage also in a similar vein is being available in a cloud environment, and then access to data. Um, and we're seeing uh, emerging models of access to data so that you can basically pull in, you know, third-party data put it in a, a cloud-hosted processing or data storage capability and run your own analytics. Sounds like the challenge, though, is just finding the talent that actually understands how these things work. But I guess to answer the, the question from the audience, absolutely, there are opportunities there. Um, and we'd love to get a specific uh, example, but I think we're, we're running out of time. So before we, before we end up, um, I'd like to ask, uh, starting with Susan, um, actually, I'm going I'm to start with Mike. Um, you're speaking to a line of business owner, and I know that you have lots of these conversations, and, and they come up to you and they say, Mike, 
Um, I'm hearing all these things about big data and cloud and integration and pick, pick a specific one, a marketing leader, a sales leader, um, or maybe even a, an, an HR accounting, whichever you prefer. And they say, I'm hearing all these things. Um, I'm trying to get my head around what they are and I'm trying to get my head around what I should do. What are just a few steps that you would recommend that they do in a sequential order? Obviously, the, the obvious answer is it depends. Um, but, but deeper than that, help to frame that question for the listeners that are, that are more on the line of business side. It, it depends. Um, no, um, you know, I think, I mean, unfortunately it does, right? Um, no, the real, the real question is this. So, so I think we get really tied up around um, big data and technology. And, and, even, and this happened in, you know, in all these sort of mobile and, and cloud. And, and all those things are just enablers. So the first thing you've got to do as a line of business person is figure out where your business problem is and figure out, you know, where the pain is and then look and see if there are ways to solve this by applying some technology or some behavioral change or some, you know, whatever it might be. Um, I, I think there's a, you know, you mentioned marketing. So, you know, marketing is one of the, the greatest opportunities that I see in the use of, of, of several of these technologies. I don't think there's any question about that. But unfortunately, uh, this has happened in marketing off and on for a while. We've, we've thrown some new things at marketing and they've tried to use them in the same way they've used other things in the past and it's not worked because they're trying to, you know, screw in a, 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 a screw with a hammer and it's just not very effective. You got to figure out what it is you're trying to solve first and then solve for that. And so, you know, data driven marketing, de definitely the right place to be. But if you're just going to do it in, in the way you've done it before, you're not going to get anywhere. So technology by itself is interesting. Big data by itself is just big and a lot of data, and that's really cool, I guess. But until I can figure out a business problem then I, th that I could apply it to, it's just not useful to me. So I, I, don't, I think that it's more about the business and less about the technology. I mean, there's all kinds of new technologies. You know, we talked about how can I get some value out of this? We have this whole new segment called value added content as a service. So there are companies that are going to take that data and behind the scenes munch it up for you and be able to serve it out to you in the way you want it. That That's happening across all kinds of sectors. And so that could be a great tool to use. But again, until you have a business problem that you're going to solve with it, what's the point? Great. Very similar question. I'm going to toss this to Betsy. She's been quiet for a little while. Um, similar question, but in this case, it's um, it's a it's a it's a senior IT leader which says, you know, listen, my line of business people have come to me and they said, how can you solve this problem for me? Um, how do I solve this problem? How, how do I figure out what data to put where and how do I tie these things together? What are the questions I should be a asking myself in order to make the right decisions? Well, I, you know, honestly, I, I think it kind of goes back to to what Mike's point was is, you know, what what is the business problem that that, le that line of business person is trying to solve, right? And really getting very specific about that. And I think that's going to get you to a place where then, you know, how do I or what do I do um, to tie that together? Because it can be radically different depending on what that question is. So if we go back to a marketing example and your line of business person is coming to you and saying, you know, I... I want to get, you know, all of my tweets about my company and I want to, you know, generate leads from that. Um, you know, you're going to look at, okay, well, do I, do I write code? Would that be the easiest thing to do? It would be the fastest thing to do, um, depending on what, what they want to do with that. Or is there a product out there um, or, you know, uh, another tool? Or does my tool support that, right? You know, is there a Twitter connector to do that? So. So I think you've got to get really down to what what is the end state that that line of business person wants to do, and then start going through very methodically about how to how to wire that up together, right? So again, I you know I, just to kind of emphasize my point is I wouldn't use you know technology out there for technology's sake. Use the best thing that's going to fit your problem. Um, so that's a fairly vague answer. I, I don't think there's a silver bullet of, oh, you know, go out and buy this integration platform or go out and, you know, get GitHub or whatever. I, you really have to understand the business problem at hand and the, and the end state of what that is. Yeah, great, great points. Thomas, uh, we're short on time, but I want to give you 30 seconds if you'd like any uh, closing thoughts or comments related to the topic today. Yeah, it's um – and the biggest thing is that it's, you know, with technology as it always is, it's always shifting. 
um, and just being able to figure out, you know, as Mike was saying, figure out what the business problem is. Um, the next biggest thing to figure out is what data do you have and is it usable? Um, and then being able to figure out, you know, are there is there other data and content that can uh, that's available um, that can give you better understanding than you currently have. That's awesome. That's great. Well, thanks, everyone. I know that we could go on forever, but to respect your time, I know we're about a minute over right now, and so I want to wrap up. Um, lots more to learn, lots of other resources. If you look on the, the slide here on the webinar, you'll see a, a link to each of those. Um, Scribe's put together some great resources, both their State of Data Integration Report and their, their blog always has insightful insights. Um, you can visit my blog, brianvelmuir.com. Um, Thomas's uh, has recently co-written a, a great book by Dave Gregg called The Connected Company. His website is personalinfocloud.com. And Mike Fossett always shares great resource, uh, great insights on his, uh, on his blog, mfossett.com. I apologize I didn't introduce myself at the start of the call. My name is Brian Belmier, and I serve a variety of roles as an analyst consultant and uh, an advisor to a lot of tech companies and their customers. So um, forgive me for that. I want to thank everyone for uh, being here today. And once again, this, uh, this webinar and conversation will be recorded. Thanks so much, and uh, have a great day. Bye-bye, everyone.